Welcome to Around the Empire. I'm your host, Joanne Leon. This podcast is listener-supported independent media. Pitch in if you can, patreon.com slash around the empire, paypal.me slash around the empire pod. Also, please like, share, and subscribe on YouTube. Gareth Porter joins us today, and as the news was breaking of Iranian retaliatory strikes on military bases in Iraq, where American troops were deployed, Gareth and I were talking about his analysis comparing the 1964 Gulf of Tonkin incident in Vietnam to Secretary of State Mike Pompeo's apparent strategy to grease the skids for war with Iran. Gareth Porter is an independent investigative historian and journalist on the national security state. He's the author of numerous books, including Perils and Dominance, Imbalance of Power and the Road to War in Vietnam, and also Manufactured Crisis, The Untold Story of the Iran Nuclear Scare. He's the winner of the 2012 Gellhorn Prize for Journalism. We recorded this on January 7th, 2020. Gareth Porter is here talking to us from just outside Washington. Hello, Gareth. Thanks so much for coming on the show. It's great to talk to you again. Hi, Joanne. Sorry, uh, uh, this has been a a problem for us to get together today, but I'm glad to be back on your show anyway. Yeah, yeah. Well, we we did it. So mission accomplished. (laughs) I'm I'm happy about that. So we had originally, we were going to talk about a different article that uh, Gareth published recently, but we both decided that what we really wanted to talk about was the Soleimani situation. That's pretty much everything uh, everyone's thinking about today because of the ramifications. And as it turns out, as we're speaking, there's breaking news coming across the line about missile attacks on U.S. bases in Iraq. Uh, They're saying it's an Iranian missile attack. I don't know anything more about it than that at the moment. Um, But... Just, I uh, just wanted to basically chat with you, Gareth, and get your thoughts on uh, the the situation that we have on our hands at the moment. Yeah, I mean, I can tell you that I I regard this situation as extremely dire because of the fact that that Mike Pompeo clearly is running the show. He is the one, the the strategist, if you will, who has maneuvered within the Trump administration to do what he and and John Bolton had planned to do uh, more than a year ago um, and during 2019 until Bolton was uh, canned by Trump, which was to uh, get Trump uh, into a position where he was approving uh, a military initiative, uh, an attack essentially, that would guarantee a process of tit for tat and therefore a military confrontation with Iran, which which was uh, that was tried in in 2019, and Trump um, refused to go along with it because the beginning point was not involving the death of an American uh, at that point, and Trump seemed to make a fundamental distinction between issues that involved Iran that uh, were other people's interests and issues that involved American lives in particular, but American direct American interests uh, in general. And, uh, you know, I think it's clear that, that um, Pompeo absorbed that lesson, understood what he needed to do in order to succeed in his quest to engineer a U.S.-Iran military confrontation and took the appropriate steps, which were essentially uh, to exploit the alleged attack, rocket attack last month on an Iraqi base where um, American contractors and military uh, personnel were located, co-located, and where allegedly a U.S. contractor was killed, and apparently that contractor today was identified, according to the Wall Street Journal report. okay, I didn't didn't know that. uh, Yeah. Yeah, that that is, uh, I've only read the first paragraph because it's behind a paywall, the rest of the story, but but they do identify the the contractor. 
Uh, in any case, Pompeo and his allies, uh, Secretary of Defense Esper and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, General Mark Miley, or uh, I think it's, I guess it's Melly is the way you pronounce yeah. it, two, two L's, uh, they have in fact succeeded then in, um, in maneuvering Trump into approving both initially the attack on uh, uh, a set of um, uh, Iraqi militia bases, the Khatib Hezbollah bases in Iraq and bases in Syria where they are apparently present. Um, and of course, with the expectation, which one would uh, clearly expect, that Khatib uh, Hezbollah and the, the people associated with them would respond by then attacking further uh, and carrying out further attacks, which they did. And then, of course, uh, we had the the um, killing of, um, of the Iranian general, um, uh, who is clearly the figure who would start a a serious uh, process of of U.S. Iran. Um, Escalation, and I again, I'm, I'm convinced that that is what Mike Pompeo was after. Now, I am writing a piece right now, and you're getting a preview of it at this moment, which argues that uh, what this uh, policy that that Pompeo has succeeded in maneuvering Trump into, the process by which that happened, is the equivalent of what happened with regard to the Gulf of Tonkin incident or non-incident. Uh, in August of 1964, when Secretary, then Secretary of Defense Robert S. McNamara uh, was aware, because he had been told by the um, chairman, uh, the, the uh, commander of U.S. Uh, forces in the, in the Pacific, um, in, early, in the early afternoon of that day, that the commander of the uh, task force, the Naval Task Force in the Gulf, was now not sure at all that there was a uh, an attack on U.S. ships and, in fact, uh, was in doubt on that and said you should not do anything until daylight when we can rec reconnoiter uh, or carry out reconnaissance by daylight. Huh? And, of course, uh, as I have documented in my book um, uh, on the way in which the United States uh, was uh, got into the war in Vietnam, uh, Perils of Dominance, the uh, uh, perils of dominance, which which is meaning the perils of, of overconfidence in one's uh, military power, which is precisely why we did make these huge mistakes, why the why the U.S. national security state made these huge mistakes. Um, what McNamara did was to not tell President Lyndon Johnson what he knew, and instead to go ahead with uh, the order for an airstrike for airstrikes against North Vietnam, the first airstrikes against North Vietnam, in the hope that that would, in fact, trigger uh, a process of escalation. It did not do that for various reasons, which we don't need to get into. But uh, I think that this is a direct parallel between the way in which Robert S. McNamara <laughs> seized Lyndon Johnson uh, and carried out the airstrikes on August 4th, 1964, with the intention of getting the United States into a war with North Vietnam, and the, uh, uh, the process by which Pompeo has tricked the present president into a process of escalation with Iran. Uh, I don't think that he was aware that it was not known whether that initial attack on the base in Iraq, where Iraqi forces and American uh, military personnel were co-located, whether that was in fact even carried out by a pro-Iranian militia or by um, uh, the uh, Islamic State, which had uh, had been carrying out attacks in that area previous to that. And uh, it was actually reported by the New York Times at that point that they did not know who had carried out the attack, that yep. it didn't stop them from going ahead. Um, and, and I don't believe that Trump was ever informed that they really didn't know who had attacked the base. Well, that's I'm really glad you brought up Vietnam here because 
I mean, I can't, when I see Pompeo, particularly when the, I guess it was the first press conference they did after the Soleimani strike, I think they were down, they went down to Florida and it was Pompeo and Esper and right. Millie, right. I guess. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And I, I could not shake the feeling that Pompeo was really the one running the show out of all three of them. And I just, I yeah. just thought we have, we've got another Kissinger, you know, we've got like another Kissinger, but your analogy. Well, I, no, I think he's, I think he's worse than Kissinger. I think that this is a, this is someone who uh, is so closely allied with Israel and with pro-Zionist uh, financiers in the United States that he is ready to sell out the most fundamental interests of the American people in order to establish that he's the man uh, in the future for them to support. Uh, and after all, we know that, that Pompeo uh, took a sudden turn in his political career in 2015 when he latched on to the issue of Iran and the JCPOA and took the most extreme position at that point, knowing that um, these uh, large financiers were already getting behind candidates um, who, Republican candidates, who were uh, carrying their water on Iran and that uh, they were guaranteed millions of dollars in support for their candidacy. Um, and, and that was the beginning of his commitment to this. So, uh, you know, I, I have no doubt that this is an opportunistic uh, career move, highly risky, I must say, but nevertheless, it was his ticket uh, to to fame and uh, you know, headlines and and sort of moving to a a, a position where he could uh, take advantage of his ties with the pro-Israeli uh, uh, universe, political universe in the future, and uh, have uh, knowledge that he could get the backing for a bid for for national office. Yeah, an extremely ambitious man. I heard that long time ago that he was politically ambitious, that he wants to be president. And I kind of disregarded that because Pompeo was, to me, he was like an unknown before all of this. And now I, I, I was saying to my friends the other day, I was like, you know, what a crazy state this country is in where a, a complete nobody uh, rises to the level of like another Kissinger, or as you say, worse than Kissinger in a short period yeah. of time. And, he, you know, he's also got, I mean, not to get personal or anything like, but he, sometimes the look in his eyes when he's talking, is just really unsettling for me. It's <laughs> like a true believer or, or and he just like stares out at nothing and just drones on and on. I'm like, whoa, man, this guy well, is really I think that's scary. Probably, probably something to that because he is a true believer. He, of course, is a believer in the rapture. He has talked about that at length. In, in various public appearances with uh, Christian Zionist uh, crowds. Um, and uh, so he is a scary character. He really is. He, he is uh, even scarier uh, in, in more than one way than John Bolton was. Uh, Bolton could easily be um, uh, tagged uh, for, for somebody, as somebody who was constantly calling for the bombing of Iran. And, uh, and he was a well-known um, a well-known commodity in that regard. And he was not that clever, uh, or, or let me put it this way, he was not that good at his handling of personalities. Yeah. He was a steamer, no doubt about that, but he did not do well in terms of handling, uh, particularly, of course, his relationship with Trump. And, and Pompeo is much cleverer in this regard, and that's what makes him so dangerous. Really. Yeah, yeah. He's clearly, you know, a very intelligent man. And a lot, a, a lot better manipulator. The things we've heard about Bolton. One of the, one of the recent phrases I heard about him is that he has sharp elbows, you know. And <laughs> he was, uh, you know, so people didn't really like him. They were afraid of him. In certain circumstances, he, you know, he he would go around. He knew the bureaucracy. That's what was dangerous about him. He knew how to, like Cheney, he knew how to manipulate the bureaucracy. Yep get things done right. in this giant ship of state but um yeah he was he was he just was you know 
I don't think I ever had to worry about him getting elected to anything, uh, that kind of thing. But yeah, Pompeo is is a much stronger character than I ever realized until recently. And I don't know much about Esper or Millie, but um, Colonel Wilkerson did an art, uh, an interview with Aaron Maté that I watched today, and you know he he was not happy with Millie. And someone else mentioned, too, you know, like, why did they even give this option to Trump if they were not prepared? Like, Wilkerson said they weren't even prepared to carry out the strike or to deal with the aftermath. And why they put it on the list of options when first, you know, the story is from all the mainstream media, of which I believe very little, frankly, uh, because they're mostly anonymous sources and, and just because of the steady decline of the media but uh for what it's worth they said that you know the military the pentagon said that uh yeah they put that option the soleimani strike option on the list but they never believed that he would take it they just put it there uh to show the extremes figuring he would always pick the middle the medium choice you know and then he picked it and they were shocked and yeah i think i read that i've read that account and and i'm not sure exactly what happened i there, there are conflicting accounts at this point of how it went down, what this, what the sequence of, of decisions were, um, and so I, that that is not totally clear. But what I think is clear is that that both Esper and Millie are weak characters who are just sort of hanging on for dear life here, um, afraid that if they were to oppose Pompeo on this. Um, given the signals that they were getting that, that Pompeo had uh, Trump's ear and, and su- general support for the general thrust of what he wanted to do, they were going along believing that if they said no, they would endanger their their futures, knowing that, that Trump can fire somebody just as quickly as he can hire them um, if he's unhappy. And I, I think that, that is, that's exactly what's been going on. And so it's really Pompeo all the way, all the way, and these other two are really uh, not um, equal in their decision-making role. I think that they are going along with this for their own careers. And they're both to, brand, to they're both their, their know, new in their jobs too, right? So yes. now under Kennedy, the Joint Chiefs were a zealous, a very zealous group, with all kinds of uh, plans drawn up extreme plans that they were like actually yeah. willing to use. So, you know, maybe the the finger needs to be pointed more at Millie here. Maybe we now have a situation where we've got joint chiefs who are don't have uh the kind of moderation that uh perhaps we had under uh Dempsey and and Dunford. I didn't know Dunford very well, but he didn't seem like an extremist. Uh but but Millie is an unknown factor yeah. to me. It seems like Dunford uh, was somebody who, uh, you know, because he was on the way out, he, he really didn't have any need to sort of cater to to, to uh, Trump in any way, shape, or form. So I think it's fair to say that Dunford was speaking for his own uh, genuine uh, views of the situation, and, and I believe he was telling Trump honestly that this is a bad idea. Don't, don't start down this road. Um, and, and that's, I think, a reflection of generally the views of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, that they, they would prefer not to, uh, not to uh, attack uh, any uh, North Vietnamese uh, target directly and get into a, uh, a tit-for-tat situation with, with the North Vietnamese. I said North Vietnamese. <laughs> I'm sorry, the, the Iranians. Um, uh, so, so I think it is not the problem of the Joint Chiefs of Staff suddenly uh, turning into um, uh, Iran war hawks. I think it is rather uh, the problem of, of Pompeo and Trump, uh, uh, Pompeo being able to manipulate Trump, and the question being whether the Joint Chiefs are ready to stand up to them. Um, that, that's a question that I'm not at all confident that we have uh, the same degree of readiness to stand up uh, to Trump that um, that we had under George George W. Bush. I mean, that that's a 
historical uh, parallel, which is which is important because, you know, during 2006, 2007, we know it's well documented that uh, Dick Cheney had his eyes on the idea of a bombing uh, Iran uh, and using uh, an incident in Iraq, no accident that that was the case, uh, an incident where U.S military personnel uh, would lose their lives in, in multiple numbers and blame that on Iran, of course, and then use that as the excuse for uh, carrying out bombing against, uh, against North Vietnamese targets. And uh, uh, at that point, uh, when the, the, uh, the idea was first uh, broached with the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, at the Pentagon in their... Uh, in the tank where they have the secret secret meetings, the um, report from uh, Time Magazine's Joe Klein was that uh, the Joint Chiefs said, no, uh, this is a bad idea. We don't support it. And from that time on, I think um, George W. Bush was not willing to uh, support uh, the idea that, uh, that Cheney continued to push and he, he never got anywhere with it, uh, I think primarily because Bush wouldn't support it. Yeah. But I think we don't, have, we don't have joint chiefs who have the same degree of determination today that we had under, uh, under uh, George W. Bush. So that, that's very worrying. Well, I mean, you know, Gareth, I have three sons who are all military age. And I won't get into many details, but they could very well be one of, one or more of them uh, stationed at one of the bases in Iraq right now. And it just shocks yes. me. It shocks me. I'm, wa I'm watching. I have the TV on mute, and they are airing the FARS, the Iranian uh, national TV FARS. And I mm -hmm. think what they're showing is missile launches. It's just some lights in the air. But um, yeah. here's what shocks me, that Millie could give uh, the president this option and carry out, I mean, technically JSOC, I guess, carried out the strike, knowing that they had vulnerable troops right there in Iraq, all over the Middle East, excuse me, but I'm re it yeah. really upsets me. And they had yeah. to scramble, not only did they have American troops in Iraq, but they had American troops in Iraq co-located with the Hashtashabi, um militias that are now part of the Iraqi military because our troops were training them. And so they're co-located and they had to hurry up. They had to shut down the training operations. I don't know what other security measures they took, but they, they had to scramble. They clearly weren't ready for this. Right. And yes, this doesn't right. add up for me. This just that do, it doesn't add up and it really angers me. And I try not to get too emotional in any of these, but you know, I don't know who's getting killed well, right now, and this yeah, was so Joanne, unnecessary. At, at this stage, I think um, being angry is the minimum requirement for those who are aware of the situation, and so I, I think that is that's absolutely normal. It would be um, it would be a problem if one were to be have as much understanding as you have and not feel that anger. So I think that's that's absolutely. Uh, the right the right situation to be in and uh, I have to say that even though I've, I've I've portrayed the situation in very dark terms by suggesting that the Joint Chiefs uh, may not have the same degree of, of uh, determination to oppose the president uh, as was shown in 2000 late 2006 I believe it was December 2006 when uh, when uh, Cheney and uh, Bush went into the tank with the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Um, nevertheless, I, I am reasonably confident that what will happen, assuming that the, this process does go, go in the direction of moving toward, uh, continuing to move toward confrontation, however that, however that happens, um, there will have to be a meeting where uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff come together and say, okay, what are we going to tell the president? And I believe that they will warn him 
about all of the things that you've just talked about and warn him that, um, that the United States, if it gets into a shooting match, gets into a tit-for-tat situation with Iran um, uh, in the Gulf, that, that we are very likely to lose very highly prized military assets as well as lose military personnel. There will be deaths of American military personnel. And beyond that, there, there are real possibilities for the war to reach into Israel and to have very serious uh, destruction and deaths um, on, on the scale of thousands or tens of thousands. Um, and so I, I think that they will tell the president that, that he should be aware of the extremely high risk and uh, dangers uh, and, and, and significant potential costs that this would involve. And that may be enough to stop Trump. That may be enough to stop him and, and to stop Pompeo. So, so that's the other side of the picture. I, I don't think that it's a, it's, it's a sure bet that Pompeo can succeed in this because of the realities that you've just mentioned and which I think are not only clearly well known by the Joint Chiefs, but, but um, something that they're very concerned about. Yeah, and it, it jeopardized, it, assuming this... Uh, mission in Syria was uh, was so important that you know they had to figure out a way to get Trump to walk back his withdrawal order from Syria. Uh, you've yeah. got right now, you, as far as I know, the um, the bases in Iraq are really important for supply lines into Syria. So you're putting that, uh, you know, if that is a priority which I, I hope it isn't, frankly, but if that is a priority, yeah, issue, right. and you've jeopardized that, too. Um, so there's that. Well, it's not just that, of course. It's, it's all of our bases throughout the Gulf, including um, Saudi Arabia, uh, where the United States now is stationing um, something on the order of 15,000 troops. Uh, maybe it's even more now. Uh, the naval base in Bahrain. All of these, uh, and, and the, the huge base in, in Qatar, Qatar, the, the yeah. forward... Uh, base of uh, St. Pac, um, um, the, the air bases at al Udaid in, in Qatar, uh, all of these are s- uh, subject to potential uh, uh, damage, destruction. I mean, they, the Iranians are not going to be able to destroy everything on those bases, but they can, uh, at least they have the theoretical capability to send drones which can uh, hit targets fairly uh, accurately. So. Uh, so there is there is a great deal of danger uh, to all of American military assets, assets throughout the region, and and the reason that I suggested that there there could be a, a difference between the present Joint Chiefs of Staff um, and and the Joint Chiefs under George W. Bush is that you had you had chiefs who were aligned with uh, the think tank commander at that point, who was uh, uh, ready to quit his job in protest, apparently. And I did a story about it at that time. Yeah. Um, and, and that was an extraordinary situation, which I'm afraid we don't have today. Um, and and that, that is uh, what, we, what we really need to be assured, that if, if uh, Trump were to give the order to carry out a strike against Iran, that the Joint Chiefs would actually say no. Um, I mean, that, that's that's the thing that would worry me, that they're not prepared to do that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I had the, this summer, I thought we were really on the brink of war. And I had a conversation with, I, I called Scott Horton because I, I was like, Scott, remind me of how we avoided war with Iraq last time. Because we did. It yeah. did involve, it did involve military brass uh, standing up and refusing to do it, uh, you know, threatening to resign and, and things like that. And I guess we were both one. Right, but let me just add that it also, in 2007, when, when Cheney was continuing to push this idea of a strike against Iran in retaliation for a multiple um, a death or, or at least a, a multiple uh, U.S. casualty uh, event in Iraq uh, that could be blamed on, on Iran, uh, the, the Secretary of Defense, and the entire Pentagon, essentially the Pentagon uh, civilian staff, 
was uh, committed to trying to prevent it. They were they were opposing it uh, with all might and main uh, in meetings that were being held. So uh, that was an additional factor that uh, was helping to turn uh, George W. Bush against Cheney in that situation. Yeah. Over so over the weekend, I I don't watch much uh, cable news, but I. I feel like if I'm going to cr- criticize that I need to at least watch some of it. And so I generally skim yes. through. I try to get a sense of it. And I did catch a couple of the very early reactions. People like um, Clint Watts and uh, Philip Mudd, I think his name is, and, and some mm-hmm, others. Mm-hmm. And one of, the common, right. yeah, one of the common threads in the things that they were saying was, well, you know, this time Iraq's going to, they're going to respond to this. They're going to retaliate. Almost like, and I, you know, this is my own sense. This is not something they literally said, but it was almost like, you know, we've been trying to uh, provoke these guys and they haven't taken the bait. And this time they're, they're really going to have to almost like they wanted it to happen. And what Lawrence Wilkerson said today was that literally is what some of these people want. They want a war, literally a war with Iran, which is just completely insane. It is insane. Yeah, yeah, and and I I agree that there are people there are people in uh, the national security elite who who hold that position and who think that nothing else counts except what they call uh, restoring deterrence, quote unquote, with Iran. Um, I mean that's that's the sole consideration. They, they're they're just so upset that the United States is not wielding its power with a determination to show Iran that we're the ones who are in control, that they simply refuse to consider any other, any other uh, uh, reality as worth, uh, as worth taking into account. Uh, but having said that, I mean, I, I think that there are definitely people uh, within the, Demo- particularly within the Democratic national security elite out of power who are very worried about this and, and who do think that this is uh, that this is beyond the pale. That this is this is unacceptable. Um, and and you're you're absolutely right that it is the considered consensus of just about everybody um, who has you know who's had a role in the national security state uh, at one time or another that of course Iran has to respond because that's what we would do. And uh, and so they take that for granted. You're right. It's it's definitely. Uh, there, there's no question in their mind. And this is one of the reasons why this whole line that Pompeo and, uh, and, and Milley and Esper were pushing, that, well, all we're doing here is, uh, is trying to deter Iran from carrying out the strikes that we assess that they were they're planning to carry out against American uh, facilities and American personnel. That, that is completely dishonest. It's, it's just a complete... Uh, uh, a manufactured line to to cover up what they really want to do, and that's to me that's the most telling evidence that that this was all uh, a hoax from beginning to end. Yeah, they were this idea of of the you know that that they uh, that they knew the, that that they had evidence or that they had good intelligence that uh, that uh, the the Iranians were on their way to carrying out a big action against uh, U.S. forces in the Middle East. There's absolutely nothing there. There's no there there. One more thing before we wrap up, because I know I need to let you go. So the, Trump has been uh, hawkish toward Iran from day one. I mean, that, that was clear. But he did make it clear numerous times that he didn't want a war with Iran. He wanted to dominate Iran. He wanted to get a better deal and brag about it. Um, but he, I take him at his word, not on a lot of things, but I do take him on his word that he didn't want a war with Iran, which, you know, I see all kinds of people extremely angry at Trump, but saying this doesn't make any sense that he would do this. So either he didn't know what the implications were going to be, or, you know, you have to question what was the intelligence given to him, uh, Pompeo and others are talking about these imminent attacks that Soleimani was planning on. Uh, And then others say that, you know, Trump uh, reacted in anger when he saw the attacks on the protests, you know, and a little bit of violence on the embassy in Baghdad, right? 
Right. The other thing that I don't see a lot of people talking about is uh, the three-year intense uh, operation against him, if you would, if, if if you ask me, of Russiagate, the intense pressure from Russiagate, the Mueller investigation, and then you know within months of being out from under the Mueller investigation, the impeachment. Uh, now the impeachment threat and that's been going on and dragging on and clearly you can tell from his tweets he's thinking about it every day and now even worse he's in limbo he's sort of like over a barrel he is he's there have been impeachment articles passed against him but nancy pelosi's sitting on them and leaving him in limbo and you know i just wonder what and, and and you've got senators like lindsey graham who's a very influential man and is one of the people who wants a war with Iran. And yeah, you know, I yeah. have to wonder if there are, you know, if if there are people, if there are enough people in the Senate who have share that sentiment, like Tom Cotton, like Lindsey Graham, and are they threatening implicitly or directly uh, their votes to convict or something like that? What do you think that these two things, what are the... What do you think the impact might have been right. on Trump's decision making, if any? Well, I, I think there are three points that I that I can make about this. The first is that it's very difficult to to understand in any rational way Trump's you know ability or, or his methodology in in thinking about and and making decisions about foreign policy things, particularly those that have to do with the use of force. Uh, I think it's complicated, and there's an emotional element to it which, you know, is, shall we say, very unusual, that he is easily mobilized into the use of force under certain circumstances, which we've already seen more than once in his administration. So that's that's part of the problem, that there's a, there's an irrational streak here alongside his uh, his seeming uh, resistance to being pushed into a war uh, in the Middle East uh, in various ways over the past three years. The second point is that I think the the impact of of the Democrats and the the national security state pushing Russia Gate the Russia Gate narrative uh, certainly had an impact on on Trump. You know, there was a moment in February of 2017 when his presidency was very new, and um, this was the high point of the pressure from the Nash, from the intelligence community, from the people who put out the what they call the Intelligence Community Assessment, the ICA, in January, um, and uh, the leftover, the, the, the people who were still there from the... Um, uh, from the Department of Justice, or had just been there in January at least, uh, putting putting pressure on Trump over Mike Flynn, uh, accusing Flynn of you know of of making himself vulnerable to Russian pressure, one of the most outrageous notions that's ever been foisted on uh, on the public, let alone on the president. Uh, remember that was that was the idea that Sally Yates put forward yeah. uh, as, as the reason why she could interfere with the Trump administration and, and tell the American people and Mike Pence that he'd been lied to by Mike Flynn. Um, but, but at that moment, it's very clear that, um, that Trump very badly wanted to save Mike Flynn's uh, uh, hide and was doing everything he could, but he felt such intense pressure that he finally let him go. Uh, he he sacrificed Mike Flynn, hoping that it would help him right his ship of state and take the pressure off him. Of course, he was wrong about that. The op very opposite happened. But I think that that just that incident, that moment, shows very clearly that Trump was and is subject to the pressure from the uh, combination of the national security state and its um, big media allies. Uh, CNN and the New York Times were carrying the, the water at that point, if you will. They were putting out these outrageous stories about how 
there was evidence that, uh, and this of course came from the infamous Steele dossier we know now, which is totally discredited, but they were putting out what they had been been told uh, that uh, there was evidence that Trump uh, Trump campaign personnel were in touch with Russians and that they were, um, you know, there was reason to believe that they were talking to them about uh, cooperation on uh, the the Russian contribution to uh, defeating Hillary Clinton. So uh, so it was a huge bow wave of of uh, bad press, and it turned turned. You know, it was basically a source of huge political pressure on on uh, on him uh, as president. Now, I don't think there's anything like that degree of pressure at this moment. I think it's a big difference between the impeachment process and that because um, it does depend on the Republicans. And um, he has held on to his base pretty well. Now, that doesn't mean that he's not subject to the consideration of, of appealing to his base if he thinks that, that this stance would, would help him. I don't know if that's the case or not. I mean, that's a big question mark. I, I think we need to know more before we can determine whether that's what's going on. Right. Um, okay, so I also heard uh, you announced that you wrote a book with John Kiriakou. Uh, can't wait to read it. Uh, please tell everybody yes. about the book and tell, uh, tell yes, them where yes. to find your work, how to support you. Okay, this this book is called um, the... <laughs> Uh, just just hold on to your hat and don't laugh too hard. The CIA Insider's Guide to the Iran Crisis. Oh, my God. From Did CIA you have food. a crystal that's ball the, or that's, what? That's the title. That's the title. And then the, the title is From CIA Coup to the Brink of War. Oh, my God. And... Uh, so so it is it is well well titled in that regard and uh, and and of course we we take the story up to the end of last year or to November at least um, and at that point um, it looked like uh, we would have a period during which Iran was going to wait out uh, the Trump administration in the hope that that he would be defeated in the next next election even if he weren't impeached. Um, but now, of course, we have this unexpected set of developments, which has completely upset that timetable. And, uh, you know, we have a different, a different set of considerations, which make the danger of war much more immediate and much more, uh, I think, much more urgent. Okay, well, uh, I'll be getting that book. I'll be reading it. Um, so please, when you're on your book tour, pencil me in uh, for a few weeks after. Yes, yeah, yeah. The book comes out uh, for you and John, or yeah, for the, you, the, or yeah. The publication date is January twenty fourth, and uh, it'll be available, of course, on Amazon, as well as it's being sold by uh, Simon and Schuster. Is is the uh, uh, they're they're distributing it? They're selling and distributing it. Oh, that's great! It's a fifteen dollar paperback. It's a low low cost paperback. Paperback. We have limited the text to uh, around ninety pages, and then there's another. 40 or 50 pages of documentation on particularly what the Trump administration has been doing on Iran. Excellent. And uh, unfortunately, well-timed. Um, but fortunately Indeed. for you, but bad for, for yeah, I know, conflicted. Um, right. And then you're, you've been writing at the American Conservative. Uh, you do interviews on Scott Horton's show. Uh, you write a bunch of right. pieces. Where I, else? I, I, I continue to publish it. Truth Dig and Truth Out, although it's been since last summer since I've done that, and uh, and Consortium News as well. Great. I'll put a bunch of links in the show notes. And thank you so much, uh, Gareth. I really appreciate it. Well, it, it's a pleasure, although the pleasure is, of course, uh, tainted with or tinged, I should say, with, with regret that it's under circumstances which are really quite uh, quite uh, dangerous and, and uh, concerning, and, and all of us have to have to feel under great pressure to do whatever we can to to uh, change this in, in whatever way we, we have the ability to change it. Very well stated. Okay, well, take care, Gareth. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks so much, Joanne. Enjoyed talking to you. Thank you for listening. Special thanks to Gareth Porter. 
Follow Gareth on Twitter at Gareth Porter. Find his work at The American Conservative, Truth Dig, Antiwar.com, Middle East Eye, and other media outlets. Around the Empire Podcast, independent media. And your support's really important. Pitch in if you can, patreon.com slash around the empire or paypal.me slash around the empire pod. Lots of ways to find and to listen to this podcast. You can find it on any mobile podcast app or at the website aroundtheempire.com, on Patreon, or on YouTube. And if you're listening on YouTube, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Follow on Twitter at Around the Empire, and we'll see you next time. Take care, everybody. <laughs>